Should we start before time, the Swiss way? It's up to you. You're on. OK. In any uh, case. <laughs> I don't know if more people will come. So hello, everybody. Hope you are good. Thanks for coming in person. I hope you could grab a drink. Um, and we are going to do now the user group introduction. In, you probably have checked in the meetup the agenda. So <coughs> let's start. Hi, Ivan. So, oops. I want to play this animation. So this even is organized by the .NET Zurich Use Group, which we have been organizing events for free for developers and for today a bit more than developers, so everybody interested. So it's meant to be a bit generic, this part of it, which is everybody can hopefully understand. And today is August is for AI. So the idea is to do focus sessions in one topic and yeah, before going, we want to thank our sponsors, MNS, Vivivau, offering solutions and for texture, and usually the location, Impact Hub, Zurich, Stanford Group, and the partners, Azure User Use Group, Lucerne User, Lucerne, uh, User Group, and .NET Day Switzerland. Casually, uh, Azure Zurich User Group and Lucerne are organizing events as well today. And uh, also Donna Day in Switzerland and Swiss Angular. So thanks a lot. Who are we? Well, first it's uh, Michael. Hey, Ooh. he's an uh, amazing engineer working on GraphQL on Chili Cream that we are happen to have him helping in Swiss Lab as well. And he is the responsible of the live stream. So thanks a lot, Michael. And we happen as well to have Nigel. Nigel, hey. He's been helping us since the beginning of the user group. And yeah, there's me as well. There's uh, Powell, uh, Laurent, Fabian, Mark Muller, and Rafa, Rafi, or Rafael Stipe, which is usually also helping with the event organization. Thanks a lot for doing that, because we are doing that and we don't get any money. I hope at least nobody here pay anything, right? <laughs> Not even for the beers, so good. What do we do? We organize events for developers, from developers. Let's go back. I was supposed to go back, sorry. And share knowledge, passion, hopefully. Networking included, and beer and pizza. Today we don't have pizza, but we will have some warm food at the end of the event. Only in person, so you cannot have that in YouTube. We don't send it. Today we have three interesting talks about AI. One is integrating AI in your application with semantic kernel. That was going to be done by Emanuele, but you know, life happens. You can have production things. He's had a production issue, his company. So he's now debugging PowerShell scripts in a big, large Microsoft Office 365. So he cannot come. Uh, and I'll be taking that on his behalf. He told me like one hour ago before they even start. So I could prepare a bit, but. We'll see. You can <laughs> tell me if I did right or not after. And we will have uh, TJ from uh, GitHub, which is amazing engineer working on, uh, I think, GitHub Copilot, right? So he will tell us everything about GitHub Copilot, present and future, whatever he can talk, of course. And then, last but not least, we will have Ivan Gulenko. Thanks, Ivan. Um, he will tell us his point of view on software careers, on software engineering, if they will change due to AI, what does he think? And the main idea is that you interact with him, challenge him, his ideas, and we have a bit of a open conversation after a small uh, statement of what he thinks about that. So what can you do? You can follow us at .NET Zurich in Twitter or LinkedIn. We are posting like there is no tomorrow seems to work because we have quite a few people here today. And you can tell your peers if you have colleagues that are not here, help us grow. This is for free. And you can propose content or speakers. Are you doing something cool at your company you would like to share? Just ping me, LinkedIn, ping Michael, ping Nigel, ping any of us. 
it does not matter. And last but not least, today is first we have a welcome reception. I will not point it. We have a .NET Zurich introduction, which we are doing now and seems to be good ahead of time. Integrating AI in your application with semantic kernel was supposed to be done by Emanuele with 10 minutes plus of question and answer. We have, after this, GitHub Copilot person and feature with DJ. And last but not least, will software engineer careers change due to AI with Iwan. And finally, last but not least, we will have warm food, warm food with the Aperon networking. And we please ask everybody when it finishes, take your bottles, put them outside on the table, be polite, um, so we don't have to clean up too much after. Thanks. And as well, we have two announcements. We have next events uh, that we collaborate or help to co-organize or give a hand in August 29, which is pretty close. There is the .NET Day Switzerland. Anybody here knows about the .NET Switzerland or has been there? One person, yes. Nobody else. Come on. It's kind of, if you do .NET, it's a .NET Day for Switzerland, which happens on the cinema in, I think it's uh, Seal City, in the, I think it's Arena Cinemas. They reserve the whole venue. And you can check it at .NET Day.ch. And um, the organizer, Manuel, gave me a 20% discount code, friends of .NET Day 2023. So if you are interested, you can remember that or make a picture. It will be later on on YouTube, this. So you can watch it there. So I leave there for a second. And I think he told me that they have like between 20 and, and 10 tickets left only. So it may be interesting. Check the agenda. It's quite packed. And then we have a GraphQL Zurich, which if you don't know, like beginning of the year, the gentleman here, uh, Michael sitting down below, and also Pascal, Pascal, hey, is one of the organizers. They started this user group, which has been happening at amazing venues. And they will talk about, yeah, in education first in the next one. So, and you can check in the meetup.com, GraphQL minus Zurich, the next event. It's quite interesting. For whoever doesn't know, GraphQL is the evolution of REST. So REST is a thing of the past, and GraphQL is kind of the future. But probably you have to ask Michael. He will explain that a lot better than I do. But more or less, that's it. We use GraphQL here in Swiss Life. So there's that. And also, they are going to use it in Digitech. All right. So that's it. The Introduction for Swiss Life was about to be done by Philip, which is my team lead. I happen to work as well Swiss Life, and he told me, yeah, Jose, do it yourself, unless anybody wants to present Swiss Life. It's an insurance company that provides a comprehensive life, pension, and financial solutions for the market. And here at BINS is what we call the IT of Swiss Life. And it's an incredible building with incredible colleagues. And I think it's pretty exciting to be here. Even we work with things which may not be so exciting in some aspects. Depends on where you end up. You can really do amazing things here in uh, aspects of technology, like work with GraphQL, work with the bleeding edge of .NET, or for example, like Franco. Hi, Franco. Uh, AI. So there's that. So I'm selling it. And for me, I've been like a bit more than three years already. And yeah, I don't look back. I'm pretty happy. Maybe I've been lucky with the colleagues, but I think it's a pretty great employer and really very happy. And as a company, what to say, the main differentiator for me in Swiss life, but that's my personal opinion, is wherever you go in Zurich in the center, you can see Swiss life building, Swiss life building, Swiss life building. So they are not putting all the assets in a bank, like, for example, Credit Suisse, which today mm, things are a bit shaking, right? So if you want your investment and your future, I think it's a good company to, to choose. Maybe it's not the cheapest, but 
maybe it's the safest. That's not for me to decide. I'm no expert. I just say that. That said, um, we will do now, uh, well, I don't think we need a pause because the next speaker is me. Um, <laughs> so you will have to be with me for a bit. Um, and I will talk a bit about semantic kernel. I don't know how many of you have heard the word semantic kernel. Raise your hands. Franco, you hear that from me a bit, but TJ, you hear that for maybe? Anybody else has heard of semantic kernel? All right, no. So I rest it, I took only 10 minutes. That's fantastic, more time to eat food than warm food. So basically I have only like 45 minutes to prepare this session. Uh, since uh, Emmanuel told me, hey, I'm sorry, I cannot make it. I'm in production helping a hand in a problem that I did not create. You know, the usual for IT and software engineers. So let's get in there. I will time myself as I like to be on time. I give me between 15 and 20 minutes and I'll give an overview. What is semantic kernel? The first thing is I'll show you a video because this video, not this one, is really fantastic. The other thing that you're also very excited to launch is the copilot stack. Right? After all, we've built all these copilots with one common architectural stack. We want to make that available so that everyone here can build their own copilot for their applications. Uh, we will have everything from the AI infrastructure to the foundation model to the AI orchestration. So one of the things that we did that greatly affected our ability to get these co-pilots out to market at scale and to do more ambitious things was to decide that inside of Microsoft, we are going to have one orchestration mechanism that we will use to help build our app. Uh, that is called Semantic Kernel, which we open sourced. Uh, and there's Just interrupting quickly, uh, this was happening on the build conference, which I think it's like a three, four months from here, right, Michael, more or less? And, and, and then it was repeated in uh, Inspire, which is mostly uh, one month or two months as well. So it's pretty reason. Session on semantic kernel later at build, which I would encourage you all to attend. Developer experience, the power of cloud and artificial intelligence. So semantic kernel to orchestrate all of these things together, puzzles that fit together. At the same time, though, All right, so you have seen basically all the board of Microsoft, starting with Sadia, going to the CTO and director of AI, coming to the last uh, person is talking about semantic kernel in the build conference. And they have done really incredible work. What semantic kernel is, it's basically an orchestrator. I don't know if you are into AI, but there's something called lang chain, which is men to orchestrate or to manage or basically make easy how to get an LLM. LLM is large language model such as ChatGPT and similar to do whatever you want and integrate it with your code base. So I think this is basically what enables this AI orchestration. You can read here semantic kernel helps us to use foundation models, AI infrastructure in the cloud, be it OpenAI, Microsoft Azure, and then it enables us to create uh, plugins and to add 
logic into this flow, and also orchestration. And in the middle of it is this semantic kernel, and this makes it easy to connect to models and memory and do what everybody wants to do. I want to do a query that goes to my code, to goes to my information, and gives me what I want in a meaningful way. What do you need an orchestration SDK? Well, basically, let me make it bigger. You want to give it memory, right? A context that you put, and the context will be used by the LLM model. You want it to create a plan. A plan is, OK, the user makes a prompt. I want to summarize and extract this information from here, and I want to translate it and I want the main topics. And then it decides what of the different things he has to do and organizes them, and it does everything for you. This sounds complicated, but we will get into that in a moment. And then you have also this Graph API. This is new, because Semantic Kernel is done by Microsoft. And the Graph API enables you to integrate with Microsoft Graph, which is a way to access its different services. So if you were with Microsoft technology and with Microsoft like Office 365, this is a way because it does a lot of the things you want to do are already done. And it enables you to do what we call semantic function and a native function. Usually, you have several steps that the user asks something, you create a kernel, you add some memories, you ask the planner to do a plan for you, and yeah, you can put additional connectors or extensions and create plugins that they will be used. But I think the best thing to do is to get started. And for this, OK, that should not be there. Um, I have some uh, notebooks that I can execute there. And I can instantiate the kernel, for example. So this installs the NuGet package semantic kernel. Then I can create a kernel with a kernel builder at the end. And depending on what I use from the configuration in the file, OK. This should be it. No. OK, that's probably not working because I reset the configuration. Ouch. Hmm. And uh, basically, I import a skill, right? So I will not execute that. And the skill can be a fun skill. And a skill is nothing more than a prompt and a configuration for the prompt. So I show you, for example, one of the skills. Mm, I think they are here. For example, the fun skill. I want the joke. And the joke is this configuration that I set the max tokens, the temperature, that's the creativity, topi, some penalties for I want to penalize for repetition, and then the parameters. I want an input, and I want a style, a choke style. And then the prompt is basically what you would write in OpenAI. And this I can load already directly into semantic kernel. Write exactly one joke or humorous story about the topics below. Joke must be G-rated, workplace, family safe, blah, blah. Very easy. And then I can call it from, for example, I have a sample app, which is the chat summary. I think it's already working. That I do the setup. Oh, 
Okay, and creates uh, interaction. This is a kind of a chat summary app that I had or simulates a conversation already existing. And um, these will create a summary using three skills concretely. It will put a summary, it will create some action items from this uh, conversation summary. So if you agree to do something, hey, you have to send that. It could even create the task in Outlook for you if I give it the permission to with integration with Graph 365. So what would that be, for example, for a recruiter, right? A pretty advanced thing. So go to the Nissan dealer, book Antarctica trip, meet up for bear watching and could even analyze it. And also one of the skills is, okay, can you put the different elements or because you have been talking about cars in this conversation. So kind of a nice summary in a useful way. And this is done like it the, with the planner, you ask, you make an ask and it will create a plan. In this case, creates first a summary, summarizes the point and then determines or identifies the action items that you talk on the conversation. It's pretty cool. I created quickly uh, an example. I think the best and easiest example is this one. So first here, it's a, this is a .NET code, very simple, where I don't have to set up a server. So it, everything is done in line. So I have here using Azure OpenAI, it's uh, creating with Azure Chat Completion Service, which is uh, what is being used behind the scenes when you open the OpenAI chat. I'm creating the kernel and then creating what is the skill prompt, right? Which I only ask, summarize the content above. I put the maximum tokens, temperature and top and create the prompt template create a configuration for it with semantic function. And then I add the summary function, registering it on the kernel. And then I put some text and then I get a summary here and execute it. Of course, I will have to call it. It's already calling it semantic function in line. So let's execute it. This was working before. I came down here. Hey, Philip. <laughs> okay, yeah. So here is the summary. And um, this is just one function call, but we could even meta chain them. I did not have time to prepare an example, but the other thing I did is do that as it would look from a file. So basically I'm executing this again, but in this case, up until I create the kernel, everything is exactly the same, but then I simply get and load the skill from the directory. Here I have some folders that I have the funny skill and I have basically this configuration generate a funny joke about an input and a style and the prompt. That's it, nothing more. I save that and in this case, I tell it joke. Uh, there's a one invoke async, time travel to dinosaur age. And I will print result one. You can see I'm using the best practices here. using console right line and uh, <coughs> just to check 
everything is working. I will put a breakpoint here and start it. And this is going to wrap these and put this configuration to call uh, ChatGPT, in this case, in, uh, in Azure, and then come back with the outcome, invoking exactly this prompt as I want. So it's a way to get this done easily in a way which is repeatable and integrate with your code. Just saying this is mostly a .NET thing, even uh, Python is supported, but it's kind of still not everything is supported there. Yeah. For example, the joke is why did the time traveler refuse to fight the T-Rex when he went back to the dinosaur age? Because he didn't want to be a dinosaur. Well, we could iterate on that, I would say. I could, for example, go to another one. So another one function is excuses. So it can be a excuse. I could not attend the meeting due to I got a coffee that had a strong laxative effect. Or I could say, let's change that. Um, hmm. This is dedicated to you. <laughs> 65. All right. So you see, I'm not lying, just making it up, putting the prompt. And the good thing is these things can be meta chain. Yeah, it takes a bit. It has to go to uh, the LLM, which is hosted in the cloud, and then come back with the outcome. And in this case, just to be fast, I'm doing three three calls there. Yeah, so the excuse could not attend the meeting because my coffee revealed a secret message on its phone instructing me to solve a urgent Office 365 crisis. Yeah, well, seems like a thing for Doctor Who. And it can even create a joke. Or do, in this case, create new context. Yeah, this is Limerick, which creates kind of a rhyme. So if we go to the Limerick, yeah, it gets a name and gets some input about, for example, a person, and puts like an expected outcome, and then write a very funny Limerick about whatever. In this case, I would do that about myself which can end up in a very bad way. Mm. Semantic function from file, result, and I want to print the result. So let me change that and execute it. Let's wait three seconds, and we should be <coughs> about that. Of course, at the moment, it's very simple. I'm just wrapping that. And uh, what I'm doing now is a semantic function. Semantic, why? Because I have a part which is semantic. It's pure text, right? And this will be interpreted by LLM that we can change by whatever model. So technically, I can put here a model execute. So there was once a coder named Jose at Swiss Life. He'd work night and day. Oh, he'd work, host grand events with knowledge, intents, and code while on stills, false would say. Not bad. Yeah. That said, let's go back to the orchestration part. One thing which is important is the orchestration, which we are uh, putting a text on the code. So for example, on the configuration, we put a description. That's not for a human to read it. It's for the LLM to read it. And this will be used by the planner. If internet wants to work. OK. So what is the planner? It's basically an orchestration where it reads the different skills and decides how to get done what you ask it. And usually, this is the one which is used, which is most supported in C-sharp. 
basic planner is not really the best, but the, the good one is sequential planner. Just saying again, this is very similar to Langchain, and the mostly benefit is integrated already with Ornet and integrated with everything Microsoft, like Microsoft Graph. And this sequential planner is the one used on the demo that I did before. So I put here interaction, and I can put again something, and here I ask the system internally how to get an AA summary and determine the action items based on the summary and also the, the most vital elements mentioned in there. All right. Why is this relevant for us? Because it helps also to add memory to it. So it makes it easy to add, uh, in the context, a document, add a memory, uh, link it to different um, uh, vector databases, which is where we have to put the information if we want our LLMs to access it. They use a kind of what you call a semantic vectorization, which depends on where you do it, can be very costly. And it is optimized for doing that, and it's happening on your own language. I'm going to show that today, but you can learn more in Learn Microsoft under semantic kernel. The documentation is really, really good. There's also two courses from John Maeda. Um, I recommend you to check them. They are really good. One is like 20 minutes basic introduction, and the other is a walkthrough to the repository, and that is really, really well done. This, the planner, is what allows this meta chaining and determines what steps it has to do. So you don't have to tell it what to do. He will decide. He may be good or bad, but it's quite smart on this part. And he does quite a lot of things. There are really, if you check on these skills, there's aside from examples, there is a summarize that makes an abstract readable. It's node generation. It detects the topics. This is what was used in this example I show you. And it's using them one after the other and chaining them. It's, it's quite impressive what it can do. The feature for that, or the, the current um, situation, is Microsoft is betting a lot of effort and money in that. So it's supported by its other company, LinkedIn Learning. They have created already two trainings. They have announced it, and they probably will announce more things. So yesterday, I was lucky to go to an event and was in front of Thomas Denke, the CEO of uh, GitHub. And one of my questions about this plugin system is that they, in the future, will enable it. Uh, so we can extend that with the plugin system of Semantic Kernel, which, by the way, it's fully compatible with the plugin system of um, ChatGPT. So you create a plugin here. You can make it simple, or you can make the full plugin. And then you can bring your plugin to ChatGPT or execute it locally in your software. And with that plugin, you can integrate with your Office 365 as you want. So it makes things really easy for integrating. And that's more or less my delivery. I hope it was interesting. If you have any questions, I'm open. <laughs> Questions? Anybody? You Pascal. Yes. Um, did you try more complex plans, and how does it <coughs> work with scaling the request? Because well, I mean, GPT-4 is probably after the Twitter API the most expensive API I've ever used. Yes. I found like several. Yes. Yeah, this will incur in cost, so just saying. 
Uh, so you have to be careful in what you do, of course. This is a call to the API, and this is charge, right? So yeah, there's that. So you have to be careful with that. So how it scales? I have not tried like massive calls because exactly that. But on the part of the planner, I would say it works. So I try mostly that over the weekends in my private desktop at home. So I tried the plan and created like two for summarization and indexation and determining, uh, give me the outcome of the main concepts mentioned in a paragraph of text. And that worked really, really well. So it could chain all these things together. So basically, it will use the skills and every semantic function inside the skills, according to the description, pretty well. So it decides what to use. And you can chain that in a very easy way. So for example, I'm using that to try to determine and verif verify a course in a course outline. Uh, and that worked really, really well. So kind of trying to get, OK, how can it, I use it uh, in kind of a real case? Also, we can use what is called native functions, which we can put, for example, math or chain, for example, to GitHub. One thing I'm trying is to fully finish understanding how does it work with uh, this GitHub. So we can ask a question to the GitHub repo. And he does uh, embeddings of all the GitHub. It downloads the GitHub, and you can really make a question to it. And I was one of the ideas I mentioned, I think, last week. Uh, to Philip is to do that with Azure DevOps. So it's one thing I have to try. But in massive scale. This would be, this would be in memory in this case. Though, right? Exactly. So but I think it's quite cool. There's also um, a few still there. Yeah. Uh, there's this repo in github.com, Microsoft Semantic Kernel. I recommend everybody to go there. And there's a chat copilot, which is like uh, the uh, chat GPT in asteroids, which the benefits is that you can see the documents used, you can see the plans and the persona. And the plans uh, gives you a bit the detail on how many tokens are you using as well in, in terms of cost, right? And you can see how it is reasoning to give you a response, which is kind of cool as well. Any more questions? Yes? So is my understanding correct here that like in those skills is basically like you have like a set of plugins and they are identified by something like a key or something and you tell the language model so here is a task. For this task the best suitable plugin or skill is this one, just return this one, and then the library takes the key and then makes another from and those from yes. Exactly. You can use the planner for that. You can also use the sequential planner and do, I want you to summarize, and then I want you to extract the uh, action items, right? Or you can ask the planner, I want to summarize and give me the items for this conversation. And then it will make the plan for you and decide which skills to use. But then it's on the lookup, then it's the loop. <laughs> it can be. It can pretty well be. All right. If there are no more questions, we will go for the next speaker. We good to go? Yes, you're good to go. Go ahead. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm TJ. I'm from GitHub. Um, I think we don't have to introduce GitHub. Everyone knows that. Um, I don't work on Copilot. I'm not uh, engineering there. I'm a solution engineer at GitHub, and which means um, I'm into pre-sales and, and talking to most of, most of the, let's say, people who will adopt GitHub. So very close to engineering team, so I do know things, what's brewing and what stuff. So happy to present that topic today, present and future. But before we start, like maybe, let's say, do a short survey. So how many of you are using GitHub Copilot? OK. Microsoft's Copilot? <laughs> Okay, no one. Chat GPT. Okay. Um, any other AI like Amazon Code Whispers or Tab Nine? Okay. Cool. <laughs> okay, good. Good room to be in, actually. So yeah, let's start. So how it is? I have few slides, so I, I won't bore you with a lot of slides. But it's just to set up the context because let's take it 
there are a few people who don't know, not using GitHub Copilot. So we start with that, show you the current state and show you what's coming. And then after that, it's going to be live demo. And yeah, so which is fun all the time because you never know what GitHub Copilot is going to spit. So yeah, just bear with me. So let's start. So that's me. It's my in in internship days, but I love that picture I'm putting on the slide all the time. So I work at GitHub right now. I've been a developer all my life, and now into solution engineering, and previously worked at SAP, Siemens, startups, everywhere. Lived in a lot of countries, now enjoying Swiss life. And yeah, so I'm, I love cloud. I hate doing on-premise stuff. I don't even want to talk about GitHub Enterprise Server. So yeah, I uh, love emerging technologies, AI part of that. Um, I blog on Medium. And recently, I founded um, a nonprofit organization which is looking into green technologies, green DevOps. So it's more on to measuring sustainability for your CI CD. So happy to talk about that as well. And uh, love watching football. Wanted to be a poker player, but now I'm stuck here. <laughs> love hiking. And yes, traveling is, is comes with, with, you know, everyone likes traveling. So let's start on how I planned it is that before we see what Copilot can do, let's see what Copilot cannot do, just so that we manage expectations here. Because there's, I've been every day talking to a lot of customers and, and a lot of conferences and people have crazy ideas. They think Copilot will change their enterprise and, and software development, so let's start. So <coughs> some people think it's GitHub Pilot. It will replace developers. Nope. Uh, let's put it that way. So it's like, no. So that's not going to happen. I think we have a talk after that as well about um, hiring and developers. So, so Yvonne will cover that. But the first thing is that it's a co-pilot. It's not a pilot. So it's won't going to replace developers. Second is, is that autopilot? Some people think it can work on its own. Today I was afternoon on a call with a customer. He's like, oh, why don't you plug that into GitHub Actions and automatically is generating code for me. It's like, okay, that's not going to work. It's crazy ideas. People have crazy ideas with AI. So yeah, that's not going to happen. So it's not going to work, so work on its own as well. It's not an autopilot. And, and can it build an enterprise app within minutes? And, and that is a question I got from Jose yesterday, and, and that's for you, Jose. So no way, Jose, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so it cannot build a full-fledged enterprise app. And when we call about enterprise app, it's not Hello World or, or some devs and everything. It's run with compliance, security, you know, there are no vulnerabilities, and, and all dependency check and everything. So that's not going to happen. So these are like three takes before we start looking at what GitHub Copilot is, right? So, so I hope we are on the same page with the expectations what GitHub Copilot can do. It's a copilot, it's a pair programmer. You are in, in charge and if you, like say, there's, there's a slide that I saw from one of my colleagues. If you, if you give shit in, you will get shit out. So it's just like, you know, what you work with Copilot is, just depends on you. So, Let's look a little bit high level architecture. You might have seen this on LinkedIn and a lot of things, but that's actually, um, let's say the high level view. So how it works is it's uh, platform agnostics. ID, we support most of the IDEs right now. So if you are in your IDE, you write a comment, it takes that comment and creates a context or we call it prompt, let's say in the, in the AI terms. And then this is feeded into, so what is important to know is that GitHub, has its own Azure tenant, so it is private. So this, this is a lot of the questions we do get. What's the difference between GitHub Copilot and ChatGPT? I can put my data in there, I can, I'm generating code, but you don't know where that call is going, what kind of controls there are, where is OpenAI running, I don't know, I, and, or tomorrow it goes down. <laughs> uh, good luck calling um, OpenAI customer service, I don't know where it will land, but yeah. So GitHub has its own tenant, it's in Azure, running in, so we take that context, whatever you're writing in your IDE, we, and, and I will cover that, what is context and what is being taken, and we try to run some checks, you know, we remove some PII information, so if you have tokens, which you should not have, we, we go ahead and, and scrub that, and then we put it into our codex model, we generate the, 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 the result, and, and then this, you know, this can be debatable, this, garbage bin or, you know, what is it? But what we do is, it's important to know that we are not storing any information. So we are taking that, we are taking your information, yes, but we are, it's ephemeral, it's gone, 
And then on the way back as well, there are security checks. So there are these filters going to extend over time. So when I started presenting Copilot, I think one year back, there was no security filter. So when I say security filters, let's say a very simple SQL injection statement. So let's say you, you say, give me an SQL statement to query a database. Now there is a security filter. It won't give you an SQL injection or a very simple out of bound array or null pointer. So things like that are in place. Uh, semantic analysis, is, uh, sentiment analysis is there. And also what's important is this duplicate detection. And that is something I would cover as well. It's, it's about how do we, if the same code is, is somewhere on a public repository, how do we detect that and what GitHub is doing that? Because apart from this, everything I think yesterday is Thomas, our CEO also covered that as well is responsible AI. It has to be responsible that, you know, <laughs> Uh, the duplicate detection, there are security filters, and also there are abusive controls, and, and things like that are in place. So that's the high-level stuff, but if you want to just look at it in a very simple, let's say, block diagram, it's exactly what's happening here. You have a code editor, there is a proxy, which is, which is in, the, in the GitHub Azure uh, managed, and then it goes to the model, and, and we have those checks in place. And on the way back as well, we are doing code quality, and, and uh, duplicate detection and goes back to the editor, right? So it's pretty straightforward. I'll take your questions, happy to take that at the end. I'm sure there might be, might be few. Um, one thing that comes up all the time with, with the generative AI is as well is about IP. And, and, and before we go ahead and see what's happening, so there's, I don't know if you know about this infinite monkey theorem. So this is like quite funny, it's just, but it's, it's, it is the theorem and it has been there. It's just like, if you get, if you give like typewriters to monkeys, they will end up writing Hamlet. And that is uh, quite true with generative AI and as well, you know, you keep on, keep on pushing the envelope, suggesting code and all that. And, and what it does is that, you know, do you, with the LLMs, accidentally you would resemble public code. And, and which is sometimes you're talking to non-technical people who want to buy it for enterprise, they don't understand. There's not many ways of writing if-else or a while loop or you, know, or you write, write GitHub Actions. It's gonna be, it's a YAML. It's gonna be the same way. Maybe variable names are changed, but it's gonna be quite same. So the research that GitHub ran is that, you know, out of all the suggestions, like about 1% of suggestions resemble public code, and most of them happens when you are starting from an empty canvas. Now, thing beauty is that, let's say you have a code at Swiss Life and all that, and when you are putting a suggestion in, the context is very specific to your code. And this code is quite different from Zurich Insurance code and, and how they have coded in. So the suggestion is anyways personalized to yours. So there's resemblance to public code is, is not there and that's generative AI. It's not copy pasting, it's creating that fresh code for you. Um, and, and we have a filter in place and which is quite important to know how we do that is you have, we strip the white spaces and suggestion, if it's matching against 150 characters, then we will flag that. Um, now, if you talk to some legal themes and all that, this is such a gray area, they don't even know what is in the law, what is not. EU is still working on it, I think. So right now, it's, it's so gray that, but this is right now, it's 150 characters. If there is a match, if you have a policy on, we will discard that, or if you don't have it enabled, we will show it in our um, unique suggestions. So that is something I can show that. Uh, okay, Q and A, but I, I have a demo, so so let's go with that. Um, cool. Let's before before I start, I think the font is good, would be fine. Uh, throw a question at you guys. Who is good with regular expression? <laughs> okay. I've been asking this question since one year. If you have been to some other talks from me, always ask. I never get a hand, so <laughs> I suck it as well. So I think that's always the demo that I start with is, is like how GitHub Copilot can make a like, okay, let's, let's put a question like, if I have to do a regular expression task, I go to regex 101. Takes me half an hour, 45 minutes, depending on how complex that is, trial, error. You bring it to a language that you like, but still, you, you, the coding characters doesn't work and still you spend like around half a day, let's say, get everything tested and running. So I've prepared something, so I was coming here. So let's, let's look at, you know, we are at Swiss Life. So 
AH3 numbers, right? Everyone has that in Switzerland, right? So let's say if you have to create a function for a Swiss AH3 numbers, yeah, how long does it take? Let's see. And I'm, I'm not even Swiss, so I don't even know if it's how many characters is that. So let's look at GitHub Copilot. So create a function. By the way, sorry, it's um, JavaScript. I'm at a .NET conference, but I'm not a .NET guy. So, uh, And uh, so as you see, I just wrote half of it. I just said create a function too. And you can see it's already giving you a prompt. It's just already auto-completing for you to validate the Swiss AH3 number. Now we talked about the context, and this becomes really important. So from where is this context coming? It's coming from the file name. So it's able to read the file name in there. So the names, how you name your files and classes, variables, becomes really important. So talk about clean code, right? We always talk about it. Now is you, you get that value from, from the AIs. If you have been uh, using clean codes, expressive names, verbs for um, functions. So, so here you see already it's an empty canvas that says create a function to validate the Swiss AH3 numbers. I will just press tab using regex. And let's see, and sounds about right, right? It's about starts with 756 and all that. So it took me, I don't know, 30 seconds, I would say, uh, to do that and suddenly you see developer efficiency, I don't have to scratch my head or do get regex 101, and I have that code, right? So it's like, I, I love it. I wish I had when I was a junior developer uh, and, and do that. But now, again, uh, also a question do I get from customers is, well, okay, do I trust this code? Will it, is it the right reg regex? I said, do you trust your code? I mean, no. What's, what's the way we trust it is write a unit test, right? So let's open that and, and, and say, okay, I have another, another file here, and I will say create a unit test. And again, so as you see, I just wrote create a unit test. I think it's visible maybe to you guys, but I say you can see that it's, it's able to create another context quickly that that file name is there, the file is open in the editor, and is able to see there is a function already which says validate Swiss AH3 numbers, right? So it's able to see that as well. So that's also a second part of the context or a prompt. If you have files open in the editor, that is also part of your context. So if you're working on the files that are related to each other, you keep them open in the editor so that the context that we are building is around 6,000 characters or so uh, that it can accommodate in there. So it will take that into context. But let's say I will do this, I will do describe, and, and right now I just, it, it is a very, for me it's, it's a very vague comment because you say just create a unit test but you haven't get, given any precise information. But if you see that already you have some unit tests here. I did a good job, last time I did ran it only gave me two unit tests. But okay, and, and yeah, so you already have the test in there. You can just go ahead and focus on, on refining those tests. Now, another example of, of using the prompts in an interesting way would be, let me remove that, and I can just use the, oops, I can use the same, and I can just continue this using the following test. And what can also do is, it can go ahead and suggest you test and and it says that's an invalid one, test that, and give you another one because it's 13 digits, I believe, and, and, and do that. So it does support multi-line comments as well, and more precise you are, more precise results you get. And let's see what happens when I do just describe. And I expect exactly four unit tests to be covered in there. Okay, it's smart enough, it just created two, but three and false in there, but yeah. So then you can see that you give um, very specific information, it takes that into context and do that. Um, all right, so we have, uh, yep, sorry. Would you be able to do this in the style, so you write the test first? Yes, um, yes, I'll, I'll link it to my blog. <laughs> and so there's also where I did TDD, and, and if you write the test first, it would be able to generate the class for you. So the, the other way around works as well. Um, Cool. What else I hated as a developer, I always put myself in, into the shoes, is, is generating test data. I don't know, especially with those um, country codes, 
some other names, other strings, and all that. And that is something also Copilot does amazing. So let's say, I will say create a JSON dict with um, Swiss. And let's see. And you can see it's thinking here at the bottom. So you need an internet connection. And to, to use that, it's not local. And you see that you have that um, test data in here. OK, Hans Muster is repeated multiple times. But if you just say, give me random names and, and, and things, it would be able to generate that for you. But it, the numbers are, are different. So that is like a little bit end to end. What is the present state of GitHub Copilot is as of today? that you would be able to use that. So you can generate your code, test data, and, and, and unit tests on that. Now, what's next, right? So I don't know. Uh, who, who is using Copilot for chat as of today? OK, two, three, three hands. OK. So, um, so let's, let's look at what is there. So we just made chat is available in beta right now. And, and what we have done is we have, it's a chat GPT-like feeling. You have a chat integrated in your VS Code here. And right now, the communication that we saw was, it was a formal, it was one way, you wait for it. And the question is, you cannot refactor, right? You want to build on that. You do some things, chat light experience in chat GPT, you give a function, refactor, and do that. Now, that is something that is possible from last couple of weeks. Uh, if you have been lucky, you've had experience, you, you saw that before. So let's take an example. Uh, again, I should get some .NET code from you, Joseph. So <laughs> uh, I have JavaScript code, but OK. So let's see, I am one of the developers, junior developers. I just joined the organization. Or I'm just out of university. I don't know what this does, but OK, let's say it would be a crappy university, but OK. Um, I have this, and, and I would like to say, OK, what it does. So, so Either I can write in here, but GitHub loves slash commands. So we have built some slash commands. I will just say explain. And, and what it does is, it's still, it's, every time I watch that, it's impressive for me. Uh, it just explains you what it does in plain text. Now, imagine there's a technical support. There are QAs. There are product managers, some things. And you want to see that, what this piece of code does. There's, or you want to learn that. So you can just do that with this. Now, if you look at this, it has an SQL injection because I just know it. I've been doing this demo for a while. Um, but if, if you know that, uh, you know, you should use parameters or prepared statements here. Um, but it, it has that. And now what I can do is I can, I can just select that. And I can just talk with chat. I can say it's using selected code, fix SQL injection using parameters and and what it does, it gives you a code here. And what I can do is I can just press the, press the button here, which is inserted cursor, and it will move the code here. And now I would say, OK, I'm still not happy with that. I, would, I, I should have add try catch block. And then I have that. And OK, but I, again, the problem is, OK, I've, I've refactored it. I've changed that. And I have to write tests, right? And, and and that is something I just love. And this one, instead of doing that, you just write slash tests. And you get tests for that, actually, for that refactoring. And it's in there. And you, you can just move that from left to right and copy that. Uh, yeah, I can do this all day. But <laughs> just, uh, just going to stop in here and, and, and show the, the value of the chat and the chat GPT-like experience. Um, just want to cover a question. A lot of people are thinking that we are using. Yeah, I'll take the question. One brief question. You um, yeah, type something like using the selected text. Text that's redundant, right? Yeah. So it, uses the, it uses the selected automatically. Yes, but it's just to be like, you know, I, I just select that and just do that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And, and, and also, the um, thing is, it's not chat GPT. Um, I will ask her, what's your favorite beer? And it's going to say, sorry, I can only assist you with programming related questions. So it's not the wild, wild west. It's just built on a different model, which is on chat GPT 3.5 right now. Will be upgraded to 4. I don't know. I cannot share that when it will be. But, uh, but it's a mo model based out of that and, and onto only for programming in that regards. Or 
have a lot of information in the uh, with with uh, knowledge about SQL injection. What is SQL injection? And you can just browse through and like through. Now, if that's not impressive a bit, so let's look at what is how you can use it in in more efficiently as well a little bit. So I have a pull request here that I opened before I came and, and this is a plugin for VS Code again. And, and so I have that, I changed the HTML here and there's a small bubble. So, I, so that's a command, I just commented on my own pull request, just uh, quite, quite crazy, but yeah. So I says change the button to, you know, change the button text to changed by AI. It's right now click me, just take an easy example. And we have added like a, a co-pilot button here with suggestions. So you can just, whatever the comments are, you can just press on that and it will take that comments from your pair or from your other developer and you can just say accept and it will do the pull request changes for you as well. Whatever the comments for your developer or senior developer wants you to make as well. And then you can do a git commit on that and, and you will resolve that. So um, yeah, so that is Copilot for chat. Uh, it can do a lot of stuff, uh, but let's look at an example with matching code. Um, let me go to, yeah. So it can write GitHub Actions as well. By the way, if you're copying, pasting a lot of them, just it can write GitHub Actions for you. That's amazing. Uh, you can say create a GitHub Actions workflow uh, to build and push the image to Docker Hub, right? And we can just do on, oops. And so right now I got the code, but I got a warning on the bottom right hand side, if you can see, right? It says matching code found. And if you click on that, that is something that is, we have just, there's a blog on that on code referencing. So we took that and we say, this is the code snippet that we found. And, and this is the license summary. So there is around, this is the matching location of all those files. And these are coming from github.com public repositories. So, so just to let you know, and if you see the license type is unknown, and, and let's say I go to the MIT one and, and, uh, and it will take you to the GitHub public repository and you can see that what is due. Sometimes they are university projects and things like that. But it's such a common code that you get that occurrence of, of that one, but have good luck knowing the license type. So I think it's GitHub is just covering his ass. We are giving you the information. You make that wise decision. What does your organization supports what's the compliance type is as well and and then do you want this code or not there's a lot of different locations and and you can do that so this is something that was thomas was talking about snippy uh, as well so this is something that is um will be um coming in as well as part of the enterprise or responsible ai thing as well would have been funny if one of your response or repository shows up here but okay uh, but yeah so but it's just to Emphasize again, it's matching with github.com's public repository. It's not doing it on GitLab or what's, what's on Stack Overflow or other things. It's just matching with, because that's the data that we have and that's what we can search and we do that. Um, great, so that is covered. Um, what's more exciting? Um, how about Copilot within your pull request, right? So you have Copilot for chat, so we call it Copilot X. A lot of say X is vision, but I'd say X is like a variable. You can change it for copilot for chat. Now we have copilot for pull request. And how does it look like is I have a pull request here that I did with copilot. And how does it look like is let's, let's go in the edit mode is you can use if, if you have copilot for pull request enabled, which will be coming, I don't know, next year, probably the future, you can use this copilot colon emoji. It will create an emoji for your pull request. And then you can use copilot summary. It will summarize your pull request like it does here. And then you can also do copilot walkthrough and it will tell you exactly what files have been changed, what has been a walkthrough for this pull request and everything. And there's an Easter egg that you can take it from today. You can say copilot poem and it will write a poem for your pull request. And if, if you look at the preview here, this is how it will look like on your pull request. You have the emoji, 
you have is generated by Copilot, co what's the commit ID, and, and here's the summary, here's this thing. And this is also funny in the poem, a pipeline for the cloud, autumn leaves falling, so yeah. Uh, GitHub loves that stuff. So that's the Easter egg. Whenever you use that, you can use Poem in there. So, so do that. Um, so yeah, so that is where we would like, there's Copilot, um, some work is happening there. There's also Test Pilot. That is something that I don't know if it comes or not, or we just enhance that, which is just for writing tests or, or things like that. Um, but one thing that is already in preview, or let's say there's a waiting list, you can do that is Copilot for Docs. I don't know, who used Confluence? I think, okay. And have you ever found a link on Confluence, the first one? I, I don't know, it's easier to Google and just to do that. I have like to do that, but it's just more like, you know, you can put your own documentation in there. Let's say, right now I'm, I'm a GitHub employee. This is my Copilot for doc setup. These are my document sets from GitHub, Azure. I have own one from let's say GitHub Engineering, Advanced Security is another product. These are internal documentation and we're using that a lot. So how this will look like, you will put your internal documentation or documentations on, on the product that your companies are working it and you can just put it into this. It's using Azure Cognitive Services, I think in the background. Let's, let's click on start a thread. You can play around first. I'm like an intermediate developer. I know this material well and all that. You can do that and, and let's say, how do I write an extension, right? It's a simple question. It will search the documentation, give you very nice articulated email, and, and you can even just go to the documentation here. You can say read more, you can go that and all that. And this is amazing. For me, I'm customer facing. Sometimes I'm writing emails from here. Just like if you, if you write, send me an email, how do I see billing from my GitHub? I just go in here and rather than copying pasting from docs and do that. So this will be also brewing for Copilot for docs. And, and you might see real value in this where you know, you're searching in throughout your documentation and do that as well. Cool. Um, there is another plugin. So we have, so this is, Copilot for Chat is a separate plugin which comes along with the matching code. There's a Copilot plugin. Uh, there's a plugin for Copilot Labs. I don't know, is anyone using Copilot Labs? No. Uh, as the name suggests, it's from our research team. It's available, you can use that. But we don't guarantee any quality because it's just about getting feedback on there. And, and, um, and it's more like for research purposes, maybe we'll materialize. So what you can do in here is that, now I can use that actually. So you can translate any language, right? Programming languages. So there's a tab for language translation and you can select this piece of code. It has been selected and I can say, translate code into, we support all these languages. So it's a, it's a lab plugin, by the way. So quality might be shit or something, but it does let me see if there is C sharp. Is it? Ah, okay. And I will see, and does it look like C sharp? I think it looks like C sharp. Yeah, so it will just go ahead and do that as well. So that is quite cool. I wish I had when I was doing my university homework. So I studied, I think first, I think first year they wanted me to convert C code and some other language, yeah. And also, um, this takes you to your old 90s, like MS Paint stuff. So they build brushes. So let's say you select some code and you can say fix bug and you just click on that and it will fix bugs for you. So it's, a, so it's more like MS Paint brushes. I don't know if you have been using MS Paint. If, uh, People, so it's it's quite cool. I like, but it's a little bit nostalgic if you're coming from MS Paint days. But uh, sometimes it works and sometimes not. Let's let's see if if it might work. On um, I need to f see if it works in there. Uh, let's see. But also readability. But they have integrated a lot of this stuff in chat with the slash commands. But I do that. And also it's test generation. This was also a lab project where they can go ahead and, and suggest a new test and you can click on that. I don't know if it works, but, and they always have new versions of it is coming and it actually does create some stuff here, but I think it's in JavaScript. I wonder why, but yeah. But yeah, so this is also another plugin that you can do and see what's happening with there. Also one thing as well is, is we have quite interesting slash commands. So fix is one of them where it will bug fix 
you have some simple ones, SQL injection, null pointers, and do that. And, and there are more stuff coming. So there's one coming for create workspace. So you're starting an empty project or something, especially with NPM, you have to write certain, I mean, okay, there are three CLI commands and all, but still, you can create workspaces, your Java directory structures, or, or especially with C Sharp, if you have special structures, so create workspaces would be there. And then they will extend these slash commands. Um, yeah, and, and another fun stuff um, is, is I, can, I can just show you as well. So um, as it was built on, on uh, um, you know, let's say, Copilot, um, sorry, uh, ChatGPT3, it has also, um, it can understand different languages. So probably let's, let's do that, I would say. I copilot. Does it respond to me? I think I have to do that demo. But I want to make a test actually um, with with someone can write. Uh, let's let's change this to to this one. Can someone write like create a function in uh, create a function in Swiss German slang? I would like to see if that works or not, because in German it works, I know. If someone wants to just write quickly, if there is a slang for create a function for anything in Swiss German. Anyone just want to write it quickly? Just Yeah, just come on, just write it, this is okay. I just have to do. Yeah. Oh, so let's see. Is it correct? Well, that's what you wrote? <laughs> well, I guess so. I mean, I don't know the structure. <laughs> no, but what do you say? Make a write a function? Same, same thing as you did with the regex before. Ah, okay. But without the regex, it just gave you a Maybe you didn't have to use bitter. <laughs> but, no. but yeah, okay, but at least it works. It at least gave you some code. But I, I think in, uh, especially, let's say, in, in, the, in, in uh, normal languages, German, French, or, or Portuguese, or other languages, you can also write in your, in your mother tongue or language as well, and you can use Copilot as well. So the results are the same. It's not dependent on that, of course. Yeah, I think that's what the present and the future, I think, People would have some questions. So happy to take questions and, and, and yeah. Yeah. So I mean you, you said at the beginning that it doesn't persist anything. So like every request or every prompt is like a new one and you need the context. So then in order to get best results you need to give it as much information as possible, right? So like yeah. past names, related files, etc. Yeah. It won't just find them because it knows the code base. No, it doesn't know it it can try to get the code base, but again, the, the limit is around 6,000 um, characters. So, and usually as a developer, if you're working on a file, you don't have the whole project open. You have like maybe three or four files, let's say seven, seven, six files, just open them in the editor. And if you have a little bit of naming conventions and all that, it, it's able to understand that context and do that. Also another tip, I would say that what you want to do, just put comments on the top, let's say, you want to call Swiss Life APIs, right? And, and just put API, Swiss Life, the URL and all, and wherever you want to use the URL, if you say call this API, it will automatically <laughs> replace that with Swiss API because you've put a comment right on the top of the file. So there's a lot of tips and tricks how you can um, uh, use prompt engineering in a way to get best out of Copilot. Like 
Yeah, a lot of companies ask me. I mean, they're selling mattresses and their code is shit. Average developers, why would you want to run on the same? Because they cannot even agree on a coding standard, right? A small organizations or even organizations or, or things. I mean, that, that, would be, that would be available. GitHub is working towards that to have custom uh, coding models, right? So let's say we would do that. Mm, I wonder how, yeah, but I mean, you know, how many companies have GPUs and things like that? The infrastructure run even a single thing to come back is, is, is a lot. It's like, you know, the, the do that. So I don't think so. That is something that, that's, uh, that would be from GitHub. I don't know, Azure provides you the whole cognitive services and, and things like that and do your LLM, LLMs and all that. But again, why would you want to do that? I don't, I don't I mean, I mean, there's, there's an answer from my CEO yesterday. I have your data. I have you are hosting your code and GitHub anyways. A lot. I have all the data. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I mean, the thing is that, yeah, yeah, you can. I think in future maybe you can. But the cost of running that would be incredibly high if you see so. Yeah. Uh, but you know, once you have that experience, and I think it has a lot of value for many companies if they can run it uh, locally, you might just get the feedback. Yeah, but I think they put it in the garbage. <laughs> just to let you know. This is just again the model is is we are moving towards cloud and everything is SaaS and and this space and this is more. It's that again, like give an example as well. It's like a company is selling mattresses and, and, and had a web shop and all that and they wanted to this was a question for like can it run suggest using our code I said your code base is so small first of all and I know that that's another question that you get from the customers and I said why do you want to do that I mean your core business is, is doing something else and your develop your coding standards is not that you're not Google or Amazon's that you are building or Microsoft in that regards you have those open source libraries and a lot to offer to the this thing you're a consumer and just consume that in a way and just pay a few dollars and consume the service at, a, at, at this thing. But yeah, but I, I get your point as well, but there's, so, yeah, sorry, go on. So, um, sorry, you for first. So. <laughs> so we, have, we are working a lot with databases, all the relational databases, so is there a way how we, I can feed the context, for example, the whole database structure to Copilot? Because when I want to write, for example, queries, complex queries, then it might be interesting to have Copilot suggest some things, how to do it better. But yeah. It needs the knowledge about the data structure. Yeah, that's true. So, I mean, I haven't done that with the database schema or some kind of a diagram that you can feed in if it's in. But I think Mermaid diagrams is something that I, I looked at the way it can generate GitHub Actions from a Mermaid diagram. So where it can take the diagram, the chat GPT, because it has a certain format, and it can generate the code for you. So I don't know if the database schema can be into some kind of a JSON or some kind of a pattern that you can feed into chat GPT. I would say give it a try. I've never tried that. Might work, might not. When you have uh, everything in a single file, it works pretty well. So when you write your query, you can basically just paste in the table you work with, and then it uses this as the context. And when you start typing, it actually knows what's going on. So you just you just to uh, so just open a SQL DPL file. SQL script, exactly. and, and I mean then it depends on how many uh, rows you have. That's it. Yeah, exactly. So if you put that schema in with chat, with chat as well, you can then iterate over the result. You get the result. You said, okay, my primary key is I don't know something else. Then it will give you suggestions, same like you would do at a chat GPT in a way. So would be interesting use case. I will try it like late.
So, yeah, I was there. Uh, I think that's similar because if you are the schema of your REST or GraphQL, you can also kind of integrate with other systems as well, right? Uh, my question was similar. It was also regarding how to customize the context for a company and regarding to something you say that ideally, for example, in either Swiss Life or whatever company would like to have a concrete model that learns about the best practices that we apply uh, and maybe even to configure and set these best practices that would be perfect or ideal. <coughs> I don't know if you're working on a model that can allow that, but that would be fantastic. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot happening, and, and then, again, it's just that uh, you don't know which way it's going to go, it's going to come to the market or not, and all that, but again, it's just, uh, uh, yeah, I started with that as well in the beginning, the expectations are too many as the product comes in right now, it's just helping developers with writing, f I always say, if you write functions and small stuff with that, it's brilliant, but if you want to build all, everything at one go, then it goes there, so yeah, probably it comes in later. So I have, there's nothing, uh, nothing coming this year, probably. Let's put it that way. Yeah, if you guys are telling uh, your your game forty percent in uh, development speed, then the expectation would be rather high. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the conversations. Then suddenly you have happening in the beginning. <laughs> Copilot was mainly with developers when it started. Then comes the I don't know if there are any middle managers, but any which way, it's a meetup. The middle managers comes and they say, "Oh, there's a tool." I can do two-week sprint in one week. It doesn't work like that. They come in like, oh, I, I would like to do this and developer efficiency and things like that. And But again, it's just, then they said, oh, it still gives out. I have to still run through code scanning. I have to still do pull requests. I said, yes, I mean, right now. They think they can just bypass everything because everything is generated by AI. And they think it's a magic wand that does that. So I just start, every time I'm just started starting with just telling you that. It won't cut your two-week sprint into one. It makes your developer happy. They will focus on something more, more productive, maybe think a bit more about the algorithm, think about, okay, let's put something over, rather than writing those JSONs or SQL statements, which can be you know, tedious work or in that way. Yeah, I mean, that's like a legal question. <laughs> yeah, it's, again, it's GDPR, PII, it's just PII is, is, let's say, someone's email address. You put a, your email address that you're the author. Usually people put their, the author, their email addresses. Sometimes you might have phone numbers as well. People just put that in the code. You have seen weird things as well. So that might be, or let's say, you have IBANs, just, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dummy IBAN, right? You're doing some test or penny test or something, you have that in comments as well. So I think all those PI is more like, I think on th those regards. I don't have like a very well articulated answer, but in that regards is that. And, and so that is something that is all scrubbed and, and something, and, and the filters are, because you will take this and after that, this is gone, the, the, the information is gone. And this is quite important as well because you um, uh, you want to spit out the information back as well. So those informations are we are not doing anything. We're filtering out already before that as well. And those those filters are quite good. Uh, I haven't seen a case yet because if something happens, I think we lose millions or billions maybe. Or so those filters are quite good with at least with uh, PII information and and. Uh, with uh, with abusive languages and other things as well. Yeah, I mean abusive language, but I don't really care about that. So those guys are sorry. Um, that means that uh, you remove this before you train the model, and then you train the model. Um, so for enterprise offering, there's no no training the model. But if you are using Copilot for let's say non-enterprise, there's an option you can opt in and opt out. And if you opt in in there then we're using that information to train. Right. So yeah, so any which way, before we take that information in and we are generating the prompt, this has been cleaned. So it has been, the engineering behind would be like, it's been cleaned, it has been pseudified or some kind of anonymized or, so it, it's not being taken into when creating prompts.
So unless the, the method that you write is called login using the ambassador, it could be something else. Yeah, but I mean, let's say, I don't know if, if you know about um, GitHub's um, advanced security. Just quickly show you. Let's go to my, oh, it's right here. So I can I can just show you like quickly. That's our demo demo version. So GitHub has a security product, right? And and secret scanning. So GitHub has already partnered with uh, with all these vendors where we know the tokens. So so this is something like you know if you have those tokens, if you are on your public repository, you will commit one of those tokens. Um, you, you you will get an email. They will remove the token for you and all that. But we have partnership, legit partnership let's say with Azure, AWSs and all that. And if you have that token as well, we know the cryptography and then in that case as well. So there are a lot of ha happening behind the scenes. But of course, if you write password is equal to ABC, I don't know if, uh, if the filter does that. That is like really uh, something where it says that is very, I, I cannot make sense of that and maybe it passed through as well. Yeah. Yeah, if you have an opt out of it. Exactly. So, as it's an opt out, probably 99.5% of the users don't do it. That means I don't care about the stuff that's um, uh, uh, on the repository because most, most likely, even that's the first thing you learn when you, when you develop it, like you just committed the uh, API secrets, never do that again, right? But during testing, running stuff locally, it's very likely that you sometimes just use. So now my code gets auto completed, so it's going to be sent to the server, which then maybe trains the data. I mean, just I I never had that. I got a uh, a foreign API secret or username or password or something. I had paths of people, even people I know, <laughs> which is a bit weird. <laughs> but I think that's why they build that filter, right? So I mean, that's that even if something is coming, so I don't know what's the what's the algorithm behind or what's the model behind which does that. But we are making sure that we, even if someone opts in and there is some sensitive information, we are scrubbing that and then trying to bring as much clean data as well because it's like to do that. Because if we are storing or we are training it, then there might be some days going to spit out. So that's the, that's the beauty of it. We are just cleaning it in before and after as well. Cool. Um, no more questions. Maybe one to end the survey, to end, end the talk as well. Just to say, like, does it look exciting? The Copilot for Chat, or hope, like maybe hands up if you think Copilot for Chat or what Copilot is doing is quite exciting. Okay, cool, great. And I'm done. Thank you. So we start the talk? Yeah. Okay. So, so welcome to the uh, last session uh, that actually Jose invited me to and said, hey, Ivan, you have to talk about AI from like, you know, the developer's perspective, from the company perspective, and um, yeah, how it might change the, the, the last session. session. <laughs> I'm sorry. Jose invited me to and said, hey, Ivan, you have to talk that about That is because AI. I have the stream open. <laughs> so. It's like AI-generated content. No. <laughs> Go ahead. So basically, um, yeah. So uh, there were, I mean, I, I thought about it. Should I do it? Should I not? And then, okay, if I can, like, uh, t talk a, a ten minutes about it, I should maybe do it. Yeah. 
And then um, if you look at this graph, um, it's from a YouTube video that had like, like two and a half million views. You can see, hey, the, adaption, uh, the adoption of ChatGPT AI is insane, right? So it's so like in super short time, there's, there's like a bazillion people that use it, right? And much quicker than any technology ever before. But for like us programmers, like I've been a programmer before, now I run a recruitment company, for, for like the programming folks, the question is, okay, is this, how core is this new technology to the actual ability to be a, a good software engineer? I want to tell a short story about me being dumb with my boss. So uh, in one of my programming uh, jobs, I was rather junior and my boss was rather senior. And I was like totally shocked. I saw him typing with actually two fingers. Like uh, he wouldn't touch type or in German, like saying fingers of steam, right? And me being like, you know, super junior, I was like, man, like, you are so, uh, so good. If you would touch type, you would be like even faster. And he would be like, no, I don't need that. I do this for 10 years. I know what I'm doing. You know, just, and I really, I would almost harass him. Like, I would say that, like, you know, for, for many, many, many times. And then I realized that, well, programming is not like, you know, shoveling a hole in the ground, right? You just like 10 people, you give one person like a bigger shovel and like they will shovel faster, right? So um, uh, in programming, it's really like that, that the output is not connected to the input sometimes. So this person maybe, while he was typing slower, he might have been thinking more. And the result, well, I mean, I don't know why, but this person definitely was the best programmer in the company. The code was extendable, readable. He got the most stuff done, despite the kind of handicap that he used, didn't use this technology called like touch typing, yeah, same thing as the So for me, this is was, like, keep this in mind when we, like at the end, we'll speak, okay, what is really actually a software engineer, yeah? And, uh, Talking about AI, we heard so many good uh, actually examples like Copilot is amazing. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about the funny things developers told me where it didn't work so well. Uh, for example, um, there was someone used ChatGPT to say, "Okay, how do I get started with this library?" Right, and it would give an answer, and the person would use this answer like for four hours. They would debug, uh, you know, trying to get it done because it looked like legit. And the right way would have been just look at the getting started guide, you know, the famous RTFM, read the F manual and stuff. And this would have been like a two minute process to get going, right? So these are the things you, you hear like over and over again, or a very experienced um, engineer, probably one of the best engineers I know, he, he said you tend to use less TDD. If you use AI tools, you tend to use TDD and uh, less iteration thinking because you're so fast, like going on an autobahn, it's a German guy, and you, you don't lo look left and right, you mostly go straight. And if you go on the German autobahn like super fast, this is really true, right? You can't, like, you focus on like one thing and you can't really like, you know, have the freedom to a little bit, you know, see what's happening around you. So um, yeah, uh, another example would be a friend of mine, he's like both a coder and a writer. He would say, I've used AI tools a few times, mainly to test the rubber duck. If I had to write um, some like, you know, BS text, I would be faster to just type it a instead of struggling against the AI to like, you know, have the output be like I want it to be, right? I mean, imagine like a writer like Shakespeare, Dostoevsky, Goethe, you know, would they use this for writing, right? And us coders, okay, yeah, we generate small functions with it, but like, where is the point where we say, okay, this is maybe a bit too much effort, yeah? So this like, if it helps me like nine out of 10 times to be like amazingly faster, like to generate the alpha number checker, but then at like at one point it does this, right? So it's like the, the tenth time, it's like undoing all the efficiency gains we had by, you know, use, using it in the first place. So it's not as easy yeah, as we had before, like, okay, hey, will this make this print like half as long? Yeah, so the business people, it's like they, will, they won't always look at the output, right? And in coding, it's like very complicated to get the correct um, result, yeah? So this is maybe today morning, I just put it, this was funny, like, I was like, hey, I get so many emails, why can't there be like, you know, people just writing shorter emails, it really sucks, you know? And then uh, somebody replied, hey, I can make you a generator that will summarize all the emails, yeah? And my first thought, all your emails, my business emails, which are like super crucial, like, to my business success, right? And my first thought was like, like, yeah, sure, would be nice, but like, if one email that is like super important will be like, you know, wrongly uh, summarized, I'll be like super mad, yeah, and I censored the, you know, what I said there because I thought this was be too, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, 
too, too harsh. But then really my feeling, like, and this you, you can tell, like, if AI is like wrong in this like crucial moments, yeah, then um, uh, so, so we really have to find the value actually, right? And this is like a thing that is like, you know, long time ago discovered, like the, when radical innovations are first rolled out, their effect is actually, will be like, you know, uh, there will be no more productivity. There will be actually less productivity because you have like an administrative effort, right? Before we had the talks, right, some of you asked questions like, hey, uh, so if I use this AI tool, I have to do this other thing more and that other thing more. So this is now the question, right? Will this administrate, like, I mean, when, if you look at the 60s or something, they would, they, they had like computers and all that and everybody was, would, would think in 50 years we have flying cars, we work only one day per week, you know. This was what people were thinking, yeah. And still we work five days a week, we don't have flying cars, so it's like with the AI, if you look around, this is a lot of positive, you know, things attributed to the potential, which is, I mean, justified. The results are there and half of you said, okay, I use this thing. And some of you really throw crucial stuff, as I understood, yeah, like for migrations and stuff. This is like uh, not trivial things. So, yeah, so the question is, okay, like, what is the point that is like actually slowing us down, right? It is not uh, mentioned in job descriptions so much, actually, right? Uh, I have to say, after eight years of recruitment, seeing, I don't know, tens of thousands of resumes, talking to thousands of people, put hundreds of people personally into jobs and then handhold them later, yeah? That like still is like, it's all about, okay, are you a good general developer? And the company still, they look at the keyword stuff, right? Um, it is how it is, yeah. Uh, the AI stuff didn't really enter the like job description, you know, sphere. The same as in the job description, you'll not find like, okay, you have to touch type with ten fingers, otherwise we will not hire you. Like it's up to you, yeah. It's like an additional thing. So the same with AI. It will help you like, you know, be faster. But the really core thing, unfortunately, I mean, some people ask me about the current market trends. So I a little bit talk about this, yeah. Like two years ago, it was like. Okay, uh, pff, you have .NET person, there's a Java job. Like, I mean, how long will it take you to pick up Java syntax? Like three weeks or something? So companies were more willing to, like, to you know, take this leap of faith and like, train people. Now, like, let's say in the last yeah, six to 18 months, it's really like only exactly like matching a senior person, like, you know, no gaps in the CV, has to know exactly the stack and technology and like, there's like, effort wasted to tell them, to tell the clients actually, hey, you know, this is obviously a good engineer, right? But um, yeah, this is where we are in at this, uh, you know, moment uh, in August 2023. Um, yeah, and uh, going back about positive things, of course, we saw it like you can work quicker, you can have um, much better new ideas. Yeah, GitHub Copilot generates you the code like from new, so it looks like, you know, really to generate new ideas, right? And you you just don't waste time, energy on this boilerplate stuff. Yeah? You can really like, use your brain for like, the actual crucial things, the business domain, the actual clean code patterns, and to have the thing um, readable, testable, and so on. Te uh, tech interviews, another positive thing I think I see is that mm, like, <laughs> you have this, you know, some companies they do like, okay, let's just chat over code and like talk to each other. This thing will be, I think, more and it's super positive because I always hated this, you know, hey, uh, yeah, we looked at your CV for like two seconds. Here's a 20 hour coding task, of course, unpaid. If it comes back and the tests run red, we will send you an auto reject. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah, uh, I talk companies out, of, try to talk them out of it. Yeah, and uh, some listen, some don't. They then find it out on their own that this, of course, doesn't work. Not even in a recession, right? Because, like, I mean, just I mean, the companies that really talk to the person, like for ten minutes, they will find out much more than doing this automated stuff, pissing people off all the time. And now, of course, with like these technologies, it's much easier to you know to say, hey, the candidate will anyway you know, use these tools, so why do you do the stupid, like, coding exercise, you'll piss them off, and it will be, like, no benefit to you whatsoever, just do the thing which is more fair, where the developer candidate invests time, as well as the hiring company. I always like to see that, right, because then it's, you know, fair, because the company invests time, the candidate invests time, then we find out it's a match. if it's a match, yes or no, right? It makes much more sense, but, like, some companies, they think they are, like, super awesome, so they can, like, you know, just uh, do can make candidates do bad things, I would say, and yeah. Um, so basically, um, 
the really important thing here where I would say um, is like programming changing, you know, as a career, it would be like here, yeah? It's, in my opinion, it's like this thinking and doing, right? This is the core, what, what is programming or a software engineering career in essence, right? So in, um, yeah, university, yeah, we learned all the computer science fundamentals, like write clean code, uh, test, it should be testable, extendable, a programmer in 20 years should be able to read it, you know, all these things, they, they, they'll be the same for the next 50 years for sure, yeah? So, of course, focus on the new, like a little bit invest time to look at the new stuff, but this, I mean, if you, if you excel at that, I mean, it's very, it's very hard to, you know, argue with that, right? But, you know, there's programming talent all over the world. Now, always we had this discussion before, yeah, like Switzerland is high, uh, you know, expensive place. And I believe programming ability is evenly distributed over the world, right? Number one, but number two is like really the reason why still we have like, you know, programming offices for like consultancies everywhere. Uh, Swiss consultancies, they would open offices in like Zurich, Bern, Basel. Why they, do they do this? Because like it's one hour drive, right? It makes like, kind of no sense. But they still do it because it, like, it has something like, you know, you have to know a little bit of local stuff, the language of some business domain, and it's already putting you ahead in front of the other candidates that are somewhere in the world. I mean, look from the company's perspective. Like the company says, okay, revenue from a developer is like, let's say 300,000. 300, so whether I should hire someone in, in Zurich for 120K as a senior developer, for example, like I'd rather, I'd rather do that than somewhere cheaper than because these people, they're already like, there's, there is some close business understanding there, right? It's for me very hard to explain because very tested knowledge, right? But in the end of the day, it's of course, like a programming, like a hairdresser, you know, in Zurich Bins here, doesn't compete with a hairdresser in Luzerne, right? It's not like that because you have to be there. But the programming profession, somehow, it didn't yet get fully remote. And even, you know, remote work, like Skype, wasn't that bad. Like, I mean, remote work didn't start with COVID or something like that. We had the technology to really work remote, like for a long time. But now, you know, it's maybe because the tools make programming, like the simple stuff easier, now it's probably even more to be good at computer science fundamentals and this local domain business understanding because this is actually a bit easier, you know? To be like a genius programmer, like not, I mean, let's be honest, you know? It's like actually hard, you know? But like if you're local, like really understand where you're in, how you can add value. Point number three is my like super favorite because this was like a, a, a sentence, do good things and talk about it. I took, um, yeah, from a professor in university who was like really in practice in like public relations and stuff. And I thought, thought ah, this is dumb. But then really like he could give like a million examples where it's like you give like a little bit of, you know, explanation in the right moment. Yeah? And you get like a salary raise, a like better deal in your job. You know, I always lead with like, hey, okay, we, have a we are a recruitment agency. But we have collected, like, I personally have over 100 reviews on LinkedIn, like people saying, okay, Ivan did not terrible work, right? Just that already, like, puts me ahead, yeah? And you, you should, like, you know, collect things that you did well during the year. So at the end of the year, when you talk to your boss, it's not like silence, but you're like, okay, I did this, this, this well. So, you know, I would like to have an increase, right? So these programmers are really, like, not thinking about because they are not trained to do that. And we as entrepreneurs, we do it like all the time. So this is something that's easy to do and it's like the benefit is like very, very, very high. That is like the quick summary. And uh, basically I wrote a whole like ebook like of like 100 pages about this. So you can grab a copy with like a discount code for the .NET community. And I opened the discussion. So maybe you have a bazillion questions, maybe you have zero, but yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, so the question is, uh, do I use AI tools for the recruitment uh, work? Um, I mean, yeah, I, for, for like Twitter, social media, I was like actually this guy I mentioned, I like, you know, mm, yeah, I think Kosa invited me because of my tweets and LinkedIn, right? Um, so I think the reason for that is that I don't use it so much. Like I tried it and then it's like, oh wow, the tweet is really good and I used it. But then like a second time, it's like, oh, it's really bad. It's not my style. 
And it's like, okay, I don't use it anymore. So my whole social media, again, is like just me doing stuff and writing stuff. So like I went away from that, right? The other tools, actually, we have like um, tools that we uh, developed ourselves that we use. It doesn't really have any, like it has nothing, I mean, yeah, okay, that's not true. We have like one thing we played around, it's like a job description generator because like a client wanted that, so we played around, we built like a tool where it's like, okay, you say like Java engineer, and then you spit out the job description, right? So, and I think that works because like, anyway, most job descriptions, they really suck, right? You, know, you, know, you notice this? <laughs> yeah, but so, are, so do actually the resumes, sadly. That's why like, um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, a two minute conversation is unfortunately needed. Like I try to make it like, you know, automate away. It's not possible, yeah? Because again, job descriptions suck, resumes suck, so what are you gonna do, right? So yeah, AI generated job descriptions, they are like, yeah, I mean, kinda, kinda okay, I guess, sometimes. But um, yeah. Um, I guess you could, what could you could do, I mean, I mean, CV parsing is surprisingly still very, very hard. Like, unless you, for example, if you get the phone number and the email address and the full name, that's already you should be happy. But for example, like the big CV um, parsers, they would still like rely on men, like mechanical Turk pars. Like, no, I'm not rely, but like they would be. That's why if you have like these big companies, if you upload your PDF, yeah, resume. They ask you, okay, enter where you went to school and blah, 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 and all this stuff. Because, because like, it's an unsolved problem. It's very hard. Like, a CV, you, you think, like, oh, this is very easy. It's, like, st almost structured data, right? Like, work, education, like, pfft. Like, but still, the big, like, super expensive APIs for that, they would still not find, like, more than this, like, basic information. So, I mean, with AI, maybe there will be something that is better at that. Or well, at least tell me if this is like somebody like focused on Java or JavaScript. Like even that would be like, whew, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. Do you think organizations that don't use, let's say, take an example, an organization that doesn't offer GitHub Copilot and is stacked, mm. tech stacked, uh, the developers or the candidates won't, don't want to apply there? Mm -hmm. because they think, okay, why mm -hmm. would I, I would go to a company where they have GitHub Copilot. So do you think there would be disadvantages for the organization who don't take, who don't use the generative AI coding stand like GitHub Copilot? Okay, the question is, uh, if a company doesn't offer uh, GitHub Copilot, will like people be less willing to apply? Yeah. Um, What's your opinion? Yeah. I have my opinion, but I won't do it. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it's a function of, uh, yeah, people having, like, seeing value at that, right? I mean, if, if people, if it's like this, that obviously people use it, like, all the boilerplate is, is, like, gone. You can just focus on the actual, like, you know, this, what we talked about, like, com like you know, computer science fundamentals, making the code, like, really proper, the clean code practices. Um, yeah, I would say, I mean, any, it's like, you know, in any craft, like in any artisan job, right? If there's like, you know, a job about like, I don't know, making nice furniture and stuff, yeah? And in this job there is like, yeah, very good tools. And there's like one like um, craftsman shop where they don't offer this amazing tools. Then probably like people will be less likely to apply there for sure. But like I've seen companies, you know, there's like people using ID, like IDEs were like also a help, let's say, and there would still be people who, you know, sit in, uh, actually the same guy, uh, hi Marcel if you're watching, so two fingers, but and he would use sublime text and everybody else would be like on an IDE, you know, with code completion, bam, 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 everything there. So it's a little bit like, some people will not care, I think. Some people will, um, will care like a lot and, yeah, you showed like super exciting, uh, I mean really like, okay, bam, 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 you're quicker through the boring stuff, so I see it to be like a big advantage, yeah, I mean. Yeah. AI solution engineers, 
So the question is uh, not like, okay, AI like, is a coding helper, but like, okay, do, do I see jobs where it's like, okay, you are an AI developer like that? Yeah, like using, mm -hmm. using the APIs. Using, to provide value for the using the APIs. Um, Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's maybe similar to the ML when like ML data science and stuff. Um, there's like, if this appears, I haven't seen that many, to be honest. But if it comes, my gut feel is, um, yeah, there's going to be like a lot of people who want to do this, right? So with the ML jobs, it's like that, that you have like, you know, if you put, just try, put a machine learning job out there, you'll have like 5,000 applications. If you put a Java Spring job out there, it's like two applications. Like seriously. I've heard that too. Yeah. So why is that? Because it's like, okay, yeah, it's like super needed. It's always like it's the media with data science and ML was the same stuff. Like it was always in the media. Oh, yeah, it's like so sought after talent. Like it will be 300K. Like, whoa. But like at the end of the day, then we as a headhunting firm, like in eight years, I didn't get the request to, to like headhunt like a data science machine learning guy, like not once. And somebody who's like, okay, can you build software that actually doesn't crash and another person can read the code? Like for this, I get like requests, like I mean, I do get the request, right, for sure. Like this is what I live off of actually. Like, you know, they're really like, okay, we need somebody who actually can do hard stuff, not like, oh, uh, uh, import NumPy, you know, like, you know, then you get, a, um, yeah. But I mean, yeah, the skill, will, I mean, to answer your question, like, I, I guess the skill will be needed, yeah. I mean, if you do like a startup, like, let's say you do a startup, like, uh, to generate really good job descriptions, right? Yeah, I guess you would need at some point someone who's like really good at that and it's hard to find. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so this, uh, uh, per, uh, uh, he, he works at like a big recruitment firm, like very big and uh, yeah, uh, he got a request of um, like, yeah, two, three, like very few, yeah. I just repeat for this. Yeah. But there, there are some, but very few. But it's going to come next year. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, but that's what, people are still figuring what AI is. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone has their own definition. When cloud came in, everyone has their, what is cloud? Should I jump on it? All right. Mm, my competitor is going. Maybe I should also go. Okay, I need an AI officer. So you hire an AI officer. Right? Suddenly you come in, like in Dubai. Dubai, UAE has an AI minister, right? the minister of AI. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, it is. Our GitHub CEO went and because we want to expand in Middle East, they um, the minister of AI. Which country has that now? So ministry will come in and all that, and you're gonna get subsidiaries and look at money, and then comes engineers, comes late. And we are the first one to be upgraded. We all are already upgrading, right? By the time this. So I think the next wave is going to be everything. Wherever we say AI, I'm, I'm applying, actually. <laughs> so like, you see that, right? You see any cloud. Oh, I'm doing AWS, but I can also do a journal, okay? Because it's cloud, right? Yeah. So, so it's, I think the next wave is, is of this, where everyone wants to build their own chatbots, own documentation, own code bases. So it would be interesting. Yeah. yeah. Then ping me anytime. You have my contact details there. And um, yeah, then, or any other last? No. Okay. So we get food, I guess. <laughs> Great. Thank you.